Stephanie? Yes, thank, thanks, uh, Fabrice, for inviting me to say a few words uh, and introducing Philippa. So we're all thrilled to have you present uh, at the seminar today. Um, so you're the Walter Prescott Web Chair in History um, and Ideas in the Department of History at the University of Texas, where you're also director of the program in British Studies. And you're currently based in Oxford, um, where you are the Eastman Visiting Professor at Balliol College. So interests, I'm sure um, we all know, like principally the history of medicine, science, gender, and race, with a particular emphasis on the British Empire and Britain. So your list of publications uh, is um, way too long uh, for me to call out all titles. So please accept my apologies for uh, picking out a few titles only. I'm sure many of us will be familiar with Victorian feminism, published in 1987, your prostitution, race, and politics, a policing venereal disease in the British Empire in 2003, um, your classic, the British Empire, Sunset to Sunrise, which is now in its third edition, and I hear, which will soon appear in Japanese, um, and also your edited volume, Gender and Empire, so published in 1994. So this is, again, a very, very short selection. Um, your most recent books uh, are a single authored short introduction to eugenics uh, for OUP in 2017 and a splendid edited volume entitled The British Empire Critical Readings with Bloomsbury in 2019. Your paper today is entitled When I Feel Very Near God, I Always Feel Such a Need to Undress and Will Address Religion, Nakedness and the Body Divine. I believe it's connected to your uh, current book project about the politics of nakedness and moral dilemmas, which we'll hear more about, uh, uh, I'm sure. Philippa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Lovely, uh, lovely introduction, Stephanie. Thank you very much. And uh, I wish I were there in Paris with all of you, but we will make do. I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Genesis 3, momentous words, we all know what follows. Adam and Eve are cast out of Eden, he to till the ground, she to suffer the pains of childbirth, and humans henceforth to expiate this original sin. The Judeo-Christian tradition boasts no monopoly on anxieties around nakedness, but it is vitally grounded in such debates. References to nakedness abound in both the Old and the New Testaments, as well as in commentary on the Bible and in church teachings. Knowledge of and shame over nakedness define original sin and the burdens of the human condition, while Christ's crucifixion, naked on the cross, determined the basic precepts of Christianity. The key biblical moment of the Old Testament is the fall in the book of Genesis, and for the New Testament, it's the crucifixion described in each of the four Gospels, so nakedness in both cases. But if the naked body has constituted a constant problem, even for theology, it is nonetheless not easy to characterize or generalize about religious attitudes towards it. Many commentaries categorically see Christianity as the grounding source of bodily shame and negative attitudes. There's good reason to do so, but there is also a powerful counter narrative stressing nakedness as a sign of, as a sign of purity, of prelapsarian innocence and of future good. Challenges to negative connotations of the unclothed body have come as much from within Christianity as from opponents, whether from sex positive Christians in the 19th and 20th centuries or radical Protestants critiquing the growing materialism of the early modern church. While awareness of nakedness has always been central to religious thought and practice, it's also always been open to contestation. Some scholars argue that the Bible exhibits an unequivocal condemnation of the naked form, the common and virulent vocabulary of abhorrence or horror conveying the absoluteness of this position. Certainly there's sound and plentiful evidence for such a reading, beginning with the apocal event of Adam and Eve's realization of their nakedness, the beginning of shame and its deep association with the unclothed body. The curse of Ham in Genesis 9 derives from his father Canaan's proximity his own, to his own father's nakedness, and throughout the Old Testament, negative associations persist in and beyond the Pentateuch. Ezekiel yokes nakedness, whoredom, and abomination. In Isaiah, Egypt is shamed by the bared bodies of Egyptian captives. Leviticus 20 lays down the penalties associated with nakedness. Such negativity persists in the New Testament where nakedness is associated with shame and desolation in Revelations. 
and we're clothing another's nakedness is an act of piety and of charity, Matthew. The Gospels make clear the humiliation involved in the stripping of Jesus before his crucifixion. Over and over, nakedness invokes shame, loss, humiliation and vulnerability, as well as a reminder of sin. Yet there are also significant biblical and theological traces of very different attitudes, which cast nakedness in a far more affirmative light, and positive attitudes towards nakedness can be found in the earliest history of Christianity. The declaration in Job 121, that naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither, naturalizes nakedness as an original state, invoking simplicity, innocence, and the possibility of ultimate redemption. The close link between nakedness and a prelapsarian state of grace unmarred by shame was perhaps most apparent in the practice of nude baptism, where a naked immersion ritual was followed by the donning of a white gown representing a new state of purity. Baptism returned the fallen human to grace, recalling Adam and Eve before their expulsion from paradise and invoking the pre-sexual innocence of the child conjured in Job and Ecclesiastes. Not everyone, however, approved. Now we're going to see if this works. Uh, did, that, did that go? Yes. The influential Puritan Richard Baxter, 1615 to 91, lashed out at the Baptists, insisting in this, his plain scripture proof of 1653, that naked baptism was in violation of the seventh of the Ten Commandments, an abominable wickedness that put its devotees on a par with savages, a sentiment that would ultimately pervade missionary activity in a world like the other. But there can be no doubt that the story of Adam and Eve, central as it was to original sin, to shame and disobedience, nonetheless also implied that nakedness could be sanctified. For prior to tasting the apple, the first couple had no sense of shame, but rather reveled in what Milton called that first naked glory. It was this prelapsarian state that sustained ideas of holy nakedness, whether expressed in baptism, the innocence of children, or beyond Christianity, infertility and other rites. The naked body could connote both sin and grace, both the carnal and the spiritual. It could symbolize the disobedience that resulted in the expulsion from paradise, or conversely, the redemption and rebirth consecrated in the baptismal rite. In early modern Europe, a small number of radical Protestant sects began, as they put it, going naked for the Lord or going naked as a sign. Their actions were intended as a critique of the materialism they felt was corrupting the church. These early penitents often adopted scant and ragged clothing, if any, alongside bodily scourges, which we'll hear about more about a little bit later, casting off the vanities of the material world, world articulating the ancient doctrine of nudus nudum Christum sequi, and embracing poverty and deprivation as a sign of their enhanced spirituality. As early as the 13th century, and often branded as heretics, small sects in Bohemia and in France worshipped naked. In the mid-17th century, a handful of English Protestant groups employed nakedness to articulate a radical critique of the established church. Quaker William Simpson was prompted in the, 18, in the 1650s by his desire to make known the nakedness and shame that is coming upon the Church of England. This radically politicized nakedness among Quakers began early in the 1650s and continued, if more sporadically, into the 1670s, with the pra practice trickling also into New England. This form of Quaker protest preceded by other Adamite sects a decade earlier, in the turbulent year especially of 1641. Pamphlets denouncing such sects circulated widely, detailing the immoral activities of naked churchgoers on the fringes of Protestant Christianity, and often including what David Cressy has called an excuse for pornographic representation. They frequently featured, as you see here, graphic cover illustrations that highlighted the mixing of the sexes, and often featured a congregant beating the erect member of another worshipper with a large stick. Protestant nakedness in the 1640s was largely an artisanal movement, and at a time when sumptuary laws designated the clothing material suitable for different classes, a radical aspect of going naked for the Lord, in tune with theological piety, of course, was its equalizing effect. Undressed, the commoner and the aristocrat could not be distinguished. They were alike in the eyes of God, one of the key messages of these radical religious groups. Images of religious martyrdom contemporary with this radicalism combined the same claim, claims to piety with a predilection for prurience. Samuel Clarke's 1651, A General Martyrology, borrowed heavily from John Fox's Acts and Monuments, also known as Fox's Book of Martyrs, 1563, that included many more and many more varied images than had Fox almost 100 years earlier. 
The illustrations in Acts and Monuments mostly showed martyrs fully and respectably clothed, even as the flames licked at their bodies. But in some editions, as you see here, there was one lengthily captioned exception, a lamentable spectacle of three women with a silly infant bursting out of her mother's womb, being first taken to out the fire and cast in again, so all burned together in the Isle of Guernsey, 1556, July 18, in which the four victims, as you can see here, are naked, surrounded by fully clothed male onlookers. Fox's text says nothing about the women being stripped before the hanging and burning, and many versions of the work do depict the women clothed within the flames. But some early editions, such as the fourth, issued in 1583, made clear that their humiliation and pain were compounded by their nakedness at the last. Clark's more lubricious text was copiously illustrated with a far greater and imaginative variety of tortures than the burnings that ca characterized Fox's more sober telling. Clark was as respectable a Puritan as one might find, yet the engravings in his book frequently uh, depicted the martyrs unclothed and unflinchingly detailed the broad range of tortures he claimed Catholics inflicted on true believers. In one engraving, men have ropes, as you see here, tied to their privy members before being hung up. In another, a woman identified as a mother endures both the whipping and having and as it says here, her dogs pulled off with pincers, a technique likely borrowed from illustrations of the martyrdom of St. Agatha. Here's a couple of good examples of that. Nakedness was a meaningful signifier of the humiliations imposed on pious victims of intolerance. Yet the condemnation of nakedness, however strident, was also in a sense always doomed, for clothing, that seeming index of respectability, was also always fatally a reminder of the first transgression, a cloak for shame made necessary because of human disobedience and the acquisition of forbidden knowledge. By the 19th century, expressions of radicalism and erotica were increasingly dissociated, though this did not sever the long-standing connections between religion and nakedness. In the visual realm, we need look only to the canvases of the controversial British artist. Whoops, I just went all the way to the bottom of my thing. I'm going to have to go back. Sorry about that. Uh, right, that's where I want to go. I'm going to go back in my slideshow. So oh, sorry. I can't. Nope. Oh dear, we seem to have a problem. I think I'm gonna to have to stop sharing and start again. Sorry about this. Give me one second to uh, kill this. Oh dear, there we go. Wide show from, take it from. Oh dear. Oh dear, 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 dear. Um, ah, sorry about this. Let me try this again. Oh dear. Ah, uh, well, I'm so sorry. We need look only to the canvases of the controversial British artist William Etty, the many engravings of William Blake, or the drawings of the eminently respectable, whoops, writer Charles Kingsley. As, and there they all are. As the revival in, bi in biblical art in the 19th century reignited debate over whether and when nakedness was appropriate, all three of these markedly different artists would turn to the condition of human nakedness as they worked out their own right. existence. The mid 19th century, in Michael Wheeler's book, was a high point in the history of the Bible and art in Christian mm -hmm. nations. There was leeway for what Burke Long identifies as the socially privileged mm -hmm. genre of biblical illustration. Etty, was Britain's preeminent painter of the nude figure in the first half of the 19th century. Born into a, modern, a, modern, a modest Methodist household in York, he inched ever closer to Catholicism in adulthood. Uh, Elected oui. Royal Academy. I think yes, someone, yes. Mike, might be on. I think somebody's. Hello? Frailty and frailty. Moral is what we call it. Yet the naked is surely connoted in a specifically biblical mode, the promise to absolution of a return to paradise. All right. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, I'll, go, I'll, go, I'll start again with that. Among the themes to which Etty frequently returned was that of the penitent Mary Magdalene, who you see here. There are at least five known such paintings. 
In them, the figure of the Magdalene is almost always fully naked and invariably partially scarred. She contemplates the usual symbols of crucifix and skull associated with this theme, signs, of course, of human mortality and frailty, moral as well as corporeal. Yet I think it surely connotes in a specifically biblical mode the promise through absolution of a return to paradise via penitence and redemption. Etty's work was part of a revival of interest in the figure of Mary Magdalene, but she was more usually depicted either with a single breast exposed or demurely converted to fully dressed respectability, a human rather than a transcendental figure. For Etty to elect to produce starkly naked depictions of the figure, as you see here, was a controversial move, both theologically and artistically. The Magdalene pictures date largely from the mid-1830s when his reputation and indeed his notoriety were both well established. Etty's nudes earned him equal portions of praise and disavowal. Some critics consistently took him to task for what they saw as his unseemly and fleshly nude women, though in reality his oeuvre was split fairly evenly between depictions of naked women and naked men. Uh-oh, uh, now it's not advancing. All right, let me see if I can. Uh, now I've got another problem, which is, ah, uh, there we go, okay. Um, so as you can see here, one of his male paintings. Although principally a history painter, his... Uh, not working. Try that. Um, I'm so sorry. Try that. There we go. His The World Before the Flood, now at Southampton City Art Gallery, like his Madeleines, took up a religious theme based here on lines in Book 11 of Milton's Paradise Lost and depicting the carnality that precipitated the flood in Genesis 6 to 9. The painting shows, as in Milton's verse, men observing, dancing with, and claiming intimacies with women, all of them in various states of undress. The scene here, I think, has a curious stateliness to it, the dancing at its center seemingly quite formal rather than bacchanalian, more Jane Austen than the Hellfire Club. The storm clouds gathering behind the revelry anticipate the coming wrath of God, unheeded by the joy seekers. Despite the formal qualities of the work and a great deal of admiration for it in some quarters, Etty's critics took great exception. A high-minded observer writing for the Literary Gazette commented in stentorian tones that, and I quote, we have already warned Mr. Etty to avoid that deadly sin against good taste, voluptuousness. We warn him again. Judging by the Magdalene paintings that followed, Etty showed little interest in following such advice, other than to insist, as he did towards the end of his life, that where no immoral sentiment is intended, I affirm that the simple, undisguised, naked figure is innocent. In the ensuing decade, the unclothed penitent Magdalene would remain among his favorite themes. In the early 19th century, the visionary poet and artist William Blake depicted Adam and Eve mourning over the body of their dead son, while the murderer tears, agonized at his hair, and flees the scene. Blake's figures, as in the earlier pictures discussed, are muscular and naked, textbook examples of his quirky opinions of both the Bible and the human form. Blake envisioned a millennial Christian morality that combined earthly delights and spiritual high-mindedness in equal parts. His biblical illustrations and his visions of both heaven and hell are filled with powerful bodies shorn of clothing, whether they ascend to the skies or fall into the eternal pit. In his feverishly busy engraving that you see here, Laocoon, the texts were added after the figures. Blake surrounded the figure of the children priest, his sons and the attacking servants with aphorisms in many, many languages. In the top right hand corner, and you can see I've circled it for you and also given you a little copy of it so you can read it. Um, in the top right, right hand corner, one of them reads, art can never exist without naked beauty displayed. It was a position to which Blake closely hewed. In his unfinished poem, The Everlasting Gospel, he speaks of the naked human form divine. Blake's conviction that Christian nudity was desirable and holy was shared by the 19th century English cleric and novelist Charles Kingsley. Kingsley imbued many of the drawings he made for his wife Fanny with a re religious meaning. In the early 1840s, he was writing a biography of St. Elizabeth of Hungary, which he planned to present to Fanny on their wedding day, some wedding present, I think. Although he made little progress on the manuscript, which he abandoned once, abandoned once family's, uh, Fanny's family finally agreed to the marriage, there are eight extant drawings from it. And they include a depiction of a saint, naked, as you see here, carrying the burden of a heavy cross on her back. Although Kingsley abandoned the project, he did not stop drawing, and in a series of, sorry, he did not stop drawing, and in a series of sketches preserved by his wife, 
Uh, and now in the British Library, he delightedly depicted himself and Fanny on the clothes. And here's just two examples of them. For Kingsley, devotee of muscular Christianity, nakedness and religion were inextricably connected as they were for Blake. His belief in the redemptive and spiritual qualities of nakedness link him to a long tradition of religious asceticism. And he adopted on occasion too the habits of expiation. One of his drawings, as you see here, shows him prostrate on the floorboards and largely naked in an attitude of penance. He explains the scene on the back in the following way. Charles is fast every Friday at 10 o'clock. But despite this taste for scourging and self-punishment, Kingsley was nonetheless an enthusiastically sexual husband. The letters he and Fanny exchanged were joyous about their sexual union, which they understood as both divine and corporeal, a celebration of all the Christian communion signified. Kingsley had predicted that their marital bed would be, and I quote, a heaven on earth, in a letter he wrote to Fanny in Oct October 1843, close to a year before their marriage. And in an undated drawing, the couple ascend heavenward in an obvious state of bliss, their provocatively entwined bodies strongly suggesting that carnal and spiritual bliss were by no means mutually exclusive. The banner above the two figures quotes Luke 8.52, in which Christ breathes life into a young girl believed to be dead. Is Fanny, in Kingsley's vision, perhaps spiritually awakened by sexual congress, achieving the fullness of divine harmony in the arms of her husband? Many of these 19th century works were, in effect, visual sermons, striving to assert a moral point. One fine example is G.F. Watt's massive nine-foot spirit of Christianity, in which a clutch of naked, innocent babies, Mark 10, 14, suffer the little children to come unto me, are gathered at the feet of Jesus. Watts described the work as a plea for religious tolerance. It was exhibited in 1875 at the Royal Academy under the title Dedicated to All the Churches. Nakedness here was the guarantor of a spiritual innocence embodied in the uncorrupted child safe under the holy gaze and of course gathered under that gaze as well. The celebrated Anglo-Scandinavian photographer Oscar Gustav Raylander's extraordinary photograph, The Two Ways of Life, offered viewers a choice between the paths of vice and of virtue in his elaborate and technically virtuoso work. While the alleged verisimilitude of its photographic nudity made it a controversial work, despite the enthusiasm of Queen Victoria, the piece was intended as a moral tale, demonstrating the gulf between idleness and toil, indulgence and righteousness, wrong and right. At the center of the image is a young man poised to make his choice. The sash around his neck resembles a cross, surely not a coincidence in such an allegorical work. To one side of him are industrious figures fully clothed, to the other side, and larger, I think, to some extent, naked figures loll into them. The fate of the latter had been envisioned some 25 years earlier by Etty, who's the destroying angel and demons of evil interrupting orgies of the vicious and intemperate, uh, intemperate it resembles. Virtue in Etty's painting appears only in the figure of the powerful angel laying waste to iniquity. The angel and those slaves sport well-developed, mostly naked bodies, the property of both the virtuous and the vicious then. And the message is akin to that of Raylander, that there are consequences to this moral choice, a choice conveyed in both cases, if differently, highly effectively by the deployment of the naked body. Yet the condemnation of nakedness, however strident, was in a sense always doomed for clothing. That seeming index of respectability, as I've said, was also a reminder of that first transgression. Absent Adam and Eve's fall from grace, the naked human was a paradisical innocent, and it was this state to which Kingsley and others aspired. When I feel very near God, Kingsley wrote to his wife, I always feel such a need to undress, as if everything which was artificial jarred me. What a bliss to see that you feel the same. The bared body of, the, of Mary Magdalene in Etty's paintings, the taut bodies of Blake's visions, the nude contemplations of Charles and Fanny Kingsley all represent a rejection of secular form, a desire to return to earlier and purer forms of faith untouched by materialism, though palpably not by physical desire. There was a longing for innocence even as they embraced the carnal. There never was a moment then in which the unclothed human form was not, in the world of Christianity, both a negative and a positive, whether in doctrinal practice, artistic representation, or exegesis of holy texts, nakedness was wielded by a variety of actors from widely different ends. It could represent the rejection of religion, 
the presence of evil and a lack of proper control, but it could also, as we've seen, signify ascetic holiness, heightened devotion, or the glory of creation. One of those characteristic beliefs in evangelical Protestantism was that nakedness in all and any circumstances constituted obscenity. One notable exception to this tendency to abominate nudity was the work of the Swedish theologian Emanuel Swedenborg, active in the mid 18th century and a major influence on, on Blake. Swedenborg linked spiritual progress and nakedness in radical ways. In his vision of heaven, detailed in a number of his writings, the angels were not richly robed, but naked. In their innocence, they had no need of clothing. Nakedness, he wrote, corresponds to innocence. He reimagined nakedness as the ultimate grace, but like Blake, his was a minority position, crowded out by a more austere and punishing perspective that equated nakedness with sexual sin and often took a virulently anti-Catholic stand. The Christian morality movements that sprang up in the West in the 19th and 20th centuries regarded control of desire, of sexual desire, as a first principle and were virulent in their opposition to the display, therefore, of the naked human body. Anti-Catholicism, long a strong force among radical English Protestants, often focused on what suspicious evangelicals saw as licentiousness of Catholic doctrine. No church and evangelical Protestants condemned all instances of nudity and on occasion took matters into their own hands, destroying works they found offensive. When the Council of Trent decreed that lascivious works were inappropriate in church settings, they were responding in large part to acts of iconoclasm in which, offenders in which offended believers had smashed works they found inappropriate. Although by the 19th century Satsa acts had become rare, they were by no means unknown. In his wonderful memoir of growing up among the evangelical Ply Plymouth Brethren, Edmund Goss tells the story of a flighty, excited young creature from his provincial congregation who, visiting London, was taken by relatives to the Crystal Palace. Here I'm quoting from Goss. In passing through the sculpture gallery, Susan's sense of decency had been so grievously affronted that she had smashed the naked figures with the handle of her parasol before her horrified companions could stop her. She had in fact run amok among the statuary and had been arrested and brought before a magistrate who dismissed her with a warning to her relations that she had better be sent home to Devonshire and looked after. Susan Flood's return to us, however, was a triumph she had no sense of having acted injudiciously or unbecomingly. She was ready to recount to everyone in vague and veiled language how she had been able to testify for the Lord in the very temple of Belial, for so she poetically described the Crystal Palace. And giving evidence before the Select Committee on the National Gallery in 1850, the British artist Thomas Owens recalled another such occasion on which, I quote, a man in a mo moment of very moral, furious rage took up his crutch and struck the picture a painting Miss Owens owned that was indeed offensive. Such behavior may have been rare by the 19th century, but the sentiments animating it were not. The shocked tones of an American Protestant clergyman traveling in Italy in the 1840s typified the anti-Catholic diatribes of its era. At Pisa, he wrote, I saw several females prostrate before the statues of Adam and Eve, which were exhibited in a state of almost entire nudity. Naked forms in marble abound in all the churches. Nothing struck me with more force than incidental circumstances like these as indicating the gross ignorance, credulity, superstition and dishonesty abounding in the Catholic Church. Both popular and pornographic fiction also trafficked visually and verbally in tales of women frolicking with priapic monks or more ominously raped by them, as you see um, in this rather extraordinary um, a piece of pornography from the late 18th, early 19th century. Matthew Lewis's 1796 deeply anti-Catholic Gothic novel, The Monk, warned of the excessive sexuality that could erupt from enforced monastic celibacy. Lewis conjured cross-dressing clerics, out-of-wedlock pregnancies, and eroticized ghosts. Tracts such as the 18th century work, The Clothes Laid Open, or The Adventures of the Priests and Nuns with some account of confessions and the lewd use they make of them, published in London, delighted in details of sexual misconduct, while pornography and even mainstream fiction reveled in fantasy-laden nunnery tales. And in a parliamentary debate in 1852, Henry Drummond, MP for West Surrey, uh, asserted that nunneries are prisons and I have seen them so used. This literature relied on a gendered reading of the ills of Catholicism, seen as an overly physical faith, which would be the downfall of womanly respectability. This animus against the hypocritical lusts of religious men and women, though commonly articulated through a strident Protestant anti-Catholicism, 
also fueled on a robust anti-clerical literature, which detailed the lustful excesses accorded priests by their privileged access to the young and in the confession box. But artists choosing biblical themes had to be attentive to the boundaries which the faithful policed, even where art's relationship to the church was conceived in less oppositional ways. Most Protestant art in the 19th century strove hard to avoid idolatry. Crucifixes, too Catholic in their imagery, were mostly absent in Protestant church decoration, and painting found favor over, potential, over potentially sensuous sculpture. Nonetheless, there were highly influential thinkers in the 19th century for whom art was the principal expression of the divine. The deeply devout Anglican politician William Gladstone believed her art had the power to redeem fallen natures, while the pre-Raphaelite artist William Hol Holman Hunt saw art as a means to make more tangible Jesus Christ's history and teaching. And indeed, G.F. Watts, whose painting I've already showed you, is very much in the same, of the same ilk. Controversy over artistic form and religious context was hardly new in the 19th century. How to represent divine figures, how to depict different kinds of worshippers, how to test the limits of the devotional were all well-worn topics. And while there had always been controversy and debate over the appropriateness, status and respectability of exposed bodies, that complexity and multiplicity had by no means lessened over time. Although Etty and other artists might find their honour and intentions questioned in some quarters, they nonetheless continued to exhibit and to sell. Among, among Etty's patrons were Anglican clergy, presumably undisturbed by whispers of the artist's unseemly dwelling on naked bodies. The Reverend E.P. Owen owned this voluptuous Venus and her satellites, and the Reverend Isaac Spencer commissioned a Magdalen painting from him as well. Nakedness and religion continue even now to ferment strong feelings, as many artists have found to their cost. Such debates are not, of course, exclusive to art. A proliferation of literature debating whether nudism and Christianity are compatible exists alongside articles in the popular press that report on congregations worshipping nude, the modern equivalent of the early modern pamphlets denouncing Adamite sects. In 2004, the Times reported on the construction of America's first nudist church, and a decade later, the decision of the White Tail Chapel of Virginia to permit worshippers to attend services naked briefly made the headlines internationally, the press dutifully reporting the pastor's belief that the decision followed logically from the book of Genesis. In 1981, Pope John Paul II addressed the question of nakedness at some length, praising modesty, but noting too the circumstances in which nakedness might be acceptable. Immodesty, he concluded, is present only when nakedness plays a negative role with regard to the value of the person, when its aim is to arouse concupiscence. There is thus plenty of contemporary debate about religion and the naked body. Modern evangelicals contest John Paul II's position regarding nakedness nonetheless as a categorical expression of sin. At the evangelical Bob Jones University in the United States, a modern bowdlerism retouches artworks to offend its to avoid offending its principal evangelical constituency. But beyond the world of evangelicalism, naked Christ images in Britain, New Zealand, the US, Germany and elsewhere have been met with protests. And in some cases, the work has as a result been withdrawn or in some cases reshaped. In the early 1990s, Catholic devotees staged monthly rosary vigils protesting the genitalia that the Catalonian sculptor Josep Subarax gave the Christ figure in his work completing the passion facade of Antonio uh, of Antony Gaudi's Sagrada Familia Church in Barcelona, as you see here. In 2000, whoops, in 2001, Deborah Masters added a loincloth to the crucified Christ in her mural, which you see a part of here, at a New York airport after protests from the Catholic League. Although she claimed, to my mind not very convincingly, that it had always been her intention to do so and that she had simply forgotten. It seems unlikely to me that one would forget the loincloth. New Zealand sculptor Lou Summers, and I'm sorry this is such a poor uh, copy, it's the only one I could find, but the New Zealand sculptor Lou Summers did the same, adding a loincloth to this in 2005 at the request of church officials at the Cathedral of the Blessed Sacrament in Christchurch, though he often joked that it was likely to fall off eventually. In that same year, Würzburg Cathedral removed a painting by Michael Trigel from an exhibition because in it, as you see here, the resurrected Christ emerged naked from the grave. And the exhibition in 1984 of British artist Edwina Sandy's naked female Jesus, Christa, in New York's Episcopal Church of St. John the Divine was cut short by protests. 
Some three decades later in 2016, the church launched its Krista project, bringing back Sandy's work as part of an exhibition of images of the suffering Jesus. And the list goes on. In every case, the objections raised encompassed both a sense of insult to faith and the dangers of encroaching secularism. In these contemporary examples, we see a clash of sensibilities, pitting the faithful against what they see as an increasingly godless and unmoored world. It's a position that ties believers to a long-standing discomfort with nudity as original sin, but ignores the discomforting presence of the naked human body in theological reasoning and the secularism perceived as undercutting it. We can see in this the impossible yearning to separate sexuality and religion, perhaps at its height in the 19th century, but as an impulse which clearly continues to this day. The tenacious power of religion and the potency of the human naked form thus continue to royal contemporary spiritual sense about sensibilities quite as much as they, have, as they have done for hundreds of years. Although public expressions of nakedness may now be more common, the long reach of theological reasoning and religious belief continue nonetheless to exert a significant degree of control. In 1959, playwright and polymath Lawrence Langner published an Adlerian psychoanalytic text on the phenomenon of human clothing. Langner drew heavily on Alfred Adler's ideas of the inferiority complex and claimed that the principal impetus for clothing lay in the desire to emphasize human distance from animality. But he also linked the same to religion, writing that, and I quote, in our Hebraic Christian civilization, we seek by every means to hide our relationship to the animal world and to relate ourselves to God. A more potent acceptance of the deep link between the unclothed human body and the religions of the world would be hard to imagine. And indeed Langner goes further, implicating not just the Judeo-Christian tradition, but other major religions as well. Langner's work has fallen into obscurity and his assertion that evolutionary progress depended on clothing may strike the modern reader as a peculiar remnant of a more celebratory age. Nonetheless, his insight that the clothing of nakedness was a preeminent and urgent concern, realized in large part, part through the strictures, practices and beliefs of religion, is surely upheld by the long history of strife, even into the present, in which the naked body has been mired. Nudity and nakedness then have long been a doctrinal combat zone, one which the encroachments of secularism have, it would seem, done little to calm. Thank you. Thank you, Philippa. And just 